Hello, good morning, everyone. I'm gonna let everyone join the webinar and get started here in a few minutes. Welcome, if you're just now joining us. Welcome, welcome. See lots of people joining, so we're just going to give them just a minute to join. I hope everyone's having a good day so far. It's I'm in Nashville, and we've been having some really awful weather up until about two days ago, and so I'm here enjoying the sunshine by my window. Great, and we still have some people joining. I'm not sure if you saw there, but Amanda asked a question about uh, the slides. I can't see. Yes, it. Amanda, yeah. you asked the question that everybody always wants to know, which is, will the slides be provided? And yes, they will be. Allie is on here as well. She's marketing coordinator and helping me out today. And she's going to be uploading those to the chat. And then we'll also be sending them with your certificates at the end of the webinar. Oh, wow, we've got someone from Ojai. Someone from the UK is on. That's great. Yes, Brenda, you guys are automatically muted and off video. So you're only gonna be able to see me. And then after I'm off video, you're gonna see Sako. Texas, South Carolina. This is great, we've got a great group here. Okay, with that, I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Um, just so you guys know, we're going to be taking questions through the Q&A throughout the, the webinar. So that's the place to put them. That's where everybody can see your question. If you have any questions specifically about technical issues or you just want to send us a comment, you can send that to me, Ali, and Sako. We can see that in the chat, but the rest of the participants can't see the chat. All right. So with that, let me close this out really quick. And Ellie, if you'll monitor the chat, that would be great. And I am gonna move you guys over. All right, guys, so the webinar that you are attending today is Weed, Games, Phones, and Porn, Strategies for Treating Modern Co-Occurring co Addictions Amongst Millennials and Gen Z. And this one's brought to you by Sako Barbarian, who's a primary therapist out of Begin Again Institute. And this webinar is brought to you by Integrative Life Network. So you probably got this uh, email to join this webinar from Integrative Life Network. But in case you didn't know, Integrative Life Network is the premier family of trauma-focused treatment centers for substance use, mental health disorders, eating disorders, and intimacy disorders. And I wanted to throw up just a little diagram because I think a lot of people, if you have heard of ILN, you may not know exactly how it's structured. And if you haven't heard of ILN, well, here you go. This is how it's structured. So ILN is the parent company of four treatment centers. Um, over here on the left, we have Integrative Life Center, which is out of Nashville, Tennessee. And I mentioned at the top of the, the webinar that that's where I am. I'm in Nashville, Tennessee today. Um, next, we have Begin Again Institute, which is where Sako is. Sako is in, uh, well, Sako, I don't know exactly where you live in Colorado, but Begin Again Institute is based out of Bertha, Colorado. Next, we have Sana at Stowe, which is in beautiful Stowe, Vermont. And then finally, we have Shadow Mountain, which has four locations across New Mexico. As I mentioned, your speaker today is from Begin Again Institute. Um, and I wanna tell you a little bit more about beginning in before we get started. It's a really cool program. I think everyone needs to know about it. Um, Begin Again Institute provides 14 day residential intensives for men, 25 years and older. 
um, who are struggling with some pretty specific stuff, sexual addiction, hypersexuality, compulsive behaviors, and intimacy disorders. And uh, we treat all of this through the TINSA model, which is trauma-induced sexual addiction, which is a neurobiological approach to treating the root cause of addiction. Um, and one of the great things about this intensive um, is that it includes a partner support program, because we know on the other side of addiction is a partner who's usually dealing with the fallout of betrayal trauma. And so we include support for those partners um, at no additional cost to admission. So um, it's really great work that they're doing out there. You can learn more at beginaginginstitute.com. And I also just wanted to let you guys know, hold on one second, if it's gonna pull up, that our next intensive starts this Saturday. So we actually have um, an intensive starting on Saturday, February 17th. As I mentioned, it's 14 days. So it's gonna go through March 2nd. And we actually have two spots available for that. So if you have a client who might need some help um, kind of getting traction in maybe their trauma work, they're in couples, um, couples counseling or something like that, and they need to just really do some deep dive into their trauma work, maybe consider sending them to this intensive. Like I said, we have two spots available and uh, you can email admissions at beginaginginstitute.com for more information on that. All right, and then a few reminders for your CEs today. Um, for your attendance to be registered in Zoom, you must use the unique join link in your registration confirmation email. So if you're with a friend and you're both joined from the same link, well, one of you is not going to get counted for your attendance. So you need to make sure to join from your, uh, your unique link. Um, you must remain on the webinar for the entire time. This is a little big brother, but we can see when you joined and we can also see when you leave. <laughs> or when you left. So um, yeah, make sure you stay on the entire time so that your attendance is counted for the whole time. Um, and then you'll need to complete the CE evaluation, which we're gonna be sending later today. Um, and we only send that to those who stayed the entire time. So make sure you're on and um, we'll export that attendee list and send you that survey. And then our, your certificates are gonna be sent after you complete the evaluation no later than Wednesday, February 21st. So we just need to give ourselves a few days to get all that information together and then we'll send you your certificate. And we're also gonna send you the slides from this webinar with that certificate. Um, finally, this webinar is being recorded and will be available to view on our YouTube channel. Um, CEs are not available for that recording. So, but you can go in and refresh your memory. If you have any questions on any of this, you can reach me or Allie at marketing at integrativelifenetwork.com. All right. Finally, let's learn a little bit about our speaker today. So your speaker today is Sako Barbarian. Sako specializes in treating uh, compulsivity with porn and sex, intimacy, intimacy disorders, substance use disorders, and co-occurring mental health disorders. He works as a primary therapist at Begin Again Institute. So if you do send a client to BAI, they will work directly with Sako. Um, and he's also in private practice. Having been born and raised outside the US, Sako knows what it's like to look at things from a different lens. His Armenian culture has fostered a love of close relationships where the messiness of human beings and all of their stuff is considered to be a part of the joy and experience of life. Having been a pre-med student with a bachelor's in integrative physiology, certified EMT, and an exercise physiologist, he likes to tie in the neurophysiological side of things into his work. In coming from a multi multidisciplinary care settings early on in his career, he believes an integrated and bi-directional approach to therapy and addiction recovery, which includes taking a look at all co-occurring disorders, such as depression, anxiety, panic, bi bipolar, and ADHD, and helping clients develop a strong cognitive behavioral skill set, while also integrating somatically focused trauma work. We love Sako. He does a great job with our clients. Last time he presented this, um, everyone loved the presentation, so I'm excited for you guys to hear from him today. Uh, let me stop sharing my 
There we go. And Sako, I'm going to turn it over to you now. It's all yours. I think you're on mute. Oh, I was just saying thanks, Tara. Thanks for the introduction and Ali for the support on the background stuff. She's doing quite a bit and helping people uh, with their technical issues here. And I'm so honored. I was just looking at how many people joined from a whole bunch of different places. And uh, there's people here from like you know Florida, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Texas, California, some folks up in Canada. Uh, I saw somebody from Sweden. Uh, I mean, Atlanta, Georgia is really representing Ohio apparently. So, I mean, Ohio's out here. And uh, all right, I see some more, <laughs> some more stuff being added. Um, Virginia, Maine, but I, I just am grateful that you all uh, are interested in this and I hope this is uh, practical and helpful. Uh, part of my goal when presenting stuff is like, hey, can somebody, can people take something away from this versus that, hey, is it just some interesting thing that I attended? And um, I guess, and let me just screen share here so that we can get this up and running. Presentation out. Okay, a uh, couple of things I wanted to touch on here. Uh, one, I know that Tara just introduced me, but uh, that's, you know, the top line there is a bit of bio info professionally. Uh, but I also work in private practice, and so I get to see stuff on an outpatient basis and um, as far and um, the intensive setting as well. So I get this like variety of, of levels of kind of care that people come in around. Uh, I'm a, you know, a card carrying millennial, um, meet like the timeline, like right on. I was 12 years old when 2000 hit, right? Which I don't think it could be more millennial than that. Um, and uh, I guess I'm part of like the slightly elder millennials versus like the younger ones. And I think the cutoff, the interesting cutoff, there's like a bunch of date ranges, but I know it's a bit somber to think about, but if people can remember, like if they can remember 9-11 happening, they're probably a millennial and they can't remember it, they're probably Gen Z at that point. Uh, so that's like a good way to like kind of ask somebody and, and figure it out. I've learned a lot through trial and error and part of what works and what doesn't work and learn from other clinicians and um, as well as, you know, this, you know, stuff around like clinical research and uh, not conducting clinical research, but incorporating the findings of that into into my work. And uh, I worked in um, co-occurring substance abuse and mental health treatment. So substance use disorder treatment for five years prior to switching to more of the process addiction space. So I was lucky to get kind of a, a three-dimensional view of addictions and a bunch of different addictions and the uh, co-occurring mental health uh, struggles that often go along with it. So before I uh, jump ahead, just as like a brief overview um, of what we're going to be covering, I'm going to kind of frame uh, a bit of the challenge and uh, present a bit of a client vignette. Uh, I think having a vignette helps people have something for this content to like kind of stick to, uh, referencing that example as we as we go along in the presentation on how to work with that particular client, for example. And uh, plus it just makes it a little more interesting. And um, I'm gonna talk about some of the challenges and factors that make um, treatment around working with millennials, Gen Z and people co-occurring co -occurring addictions a little bit more difficult. So we're talking about kind of the problem, right? And then we'll transition to uh, solutions. Hey, here's some ideas and avenues to uh, pursue, as I say the word solution, some part of me is pausing. Like, I don't know if they're like problem solution. I don't know if it's that linear, but certainly some uh, ways in which one can diversify, like how many different uh, areas of care and uh, avenues one is pursuing. That way we don't just get stuck in one rut with people, which is often what happens with multiple co-occurring addictions and, uh, mental health struggles. So we'll be talking about all that as we move through. Okay, so the client vignette um, is that 
this is a 27 year old male identifying client uh, who comes into substance uh, tr uh, treatment for substance use disorder. So that's what gets them in through the door. They uh, are uh, admitted to uh, an inpatient program, uh, which includes uh, kind of withdrawal management or detox. And then they uh, transition to uh, the inpatient program, inpatient unit. And they're uh, identifying cannabis, alcohol, uh, stimulant, in this case, Adderall, um, uh, as their primary issues. And when they come into treatment, admissions goes, their admission is fine, pretty smooth. They're doing pretty well in the program, participating well in treatment activities, but outside of treatment activities, they seem pretty glued to their phone. They take their phone with them to the bathroom. They are looking up YouTube videos for this game that they're playing. And there's a, there's a strong attachment to their device, right? But generally their attitude is bright, participatory. And so overall there aren't like big red flags that go up in the context of a um, SUD, a substance use disorder um, and mental health program. And it seems like during periods where they have to put their device away for some significant amount of time, they become edgy and irritable and, uh, and, and there's a shift within them, right? And they do well within this program, but their counselor and the staff don't really explore and uh, address. Uh, they've got some co-occurring addictions, which they're basically kind of unaware of. They um, um, are using pornography increasingly compulsively, and the content that they're viewing is becoming more intense, more extreme, more aggressive, or uh, degrading. And uh, their relationship to it is changing where it's playing a bigger and bigger role within their life and it's causing disruptions within their primary relationship and their relationship with themselves. But of course, they're not necessarily aware of this piece. And, um, and, and gaming, um, video games, as well as general attachment to their uh, phone is also one of the challenges, but they don't necessarily talk about that with their counselor. So they do well in inpatient treatment. They address the substance use disorder piece, um, but there isn't enough talk about the process addictions. Now, they do explore that they have this pattern, right, of um, the counselor asks them about, hey, what does a night of use kind of look like for you? And they often come home uh, after school or work and they take double their prescribed dose of Adderall and they begin gaming. This person plays this game, let's say called Baldur's Gate. It's a popular video game I right now. And um, they also begin uh, drinking as the night goes on to essentially wind down, right? Because the Adderall is an upper. And then um, as they uh, as they combine that with video games, there was this like really big dopamine high, sympathetic nervous system high, but they start drinking to start bringing themselves down and they smoke throughout some of this period too, but the smoking happens at different points of the day. It's kind of like their maintenance substance, right? And uh, and there's this strong connection between the video games and uh, uh, screens and their process uh, addiction, um, which they often pause and they masturbate, view pornography as they're going to sleep, or they'll stop gaming to view pornography. So there's this woven interaction between all of these things. Their uh, your analysis, their UAs and breathalyzers come back as unremarkable within the inpatient program, and they transition to an intensive outpatient program. So uh, 12 weeks of um, three times a week uh, for uh, three hours a pop for that. So about nine hours of treatment in addition to seeing an individual therapist. So they're doing about 10 hours of, of therapy a week. And they, rel they seem to be doing okay in IOP, but they decide that... Um, they, 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 the pink cloud effect of going into treatment wears off and they start to um, crave playing video games again. And again, they don't have it in front of their eyes as like a potential threat. And as they move through IOP, they are like, okay, like I want to start incorporating some more fun things in my life. I've given it a bit of a break. And they start playing games again. And the moment they start playing games again, their cravings for substances also escalate at the same time. And within eight to nine weeks, they are back to using cannabis and drinking when they play. It's not every day, but the frequency is starting to go up. They hide this behavior until one of their peers confronts them in that program. And they re-up for another round of IOP. 
but they kind of start falling into this cycle of doing well for a while, for about a month to a month and a half, and then looping back. So if this is something that sounds familiar, someone doing well, committing to uh, a new way of living within their recovery and then falling back in, that's really common around these co-occurring addictions. So uh, thanks for hanging in there while I, I broke down that client vignette. Um, and so just generally looking at what the landscape uh, of, of uh, the world out there for millennials and Gen Z around this stuff and for co-occurring addictions looks like. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll just kind of break down some of the little points of it. But there's this belief in the addiction treatment world that you know addiction is addiction. And that's generally true, right? And yet there's a complexity in the interactions when someone has substance and process addictions going on at the same time. Oftentimes process addictions are more complex. Their relationship uh, to people is, are, are more complicated. And that may be true for, you know, eating disorders are generally more complicated. Um, uh, intimacy disorders, so sex addiction, pornography addiction, love addiction, more complicated. Um, uh, screen addiction is more complicated. Gambling, more complicated. And I'm not trying to say that they're somehow like just harder to work with that substance use cannot have complications because it absolutely can. Um, and, 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 and substance addictions are often, um, you know, they have a certain level of lethality and ability to hijack people to a much greater degree in its immediacy. But as far as like getting the tentacles of the addiction off of a person, it's often more complicated with process addictions. And so, Another reality is that younger generations have been bombarded with exposure and access to technology. Um, and there's some, some challenges that uh, uh, millennials and Gen Z are facing as a generation, which have not necessarily been true of generations before that. Of course, technology is integrated into all of our lives at this point, unless one is like a Luddite or is living in such a way that they're consciously keeping themselves away from it, which I guess some people choose. But uh, these are the two uh, generations that are going through, we're kind of going through an in vivo experiment, like a real life experiment of what happens to the human brain when you expose it to high speed internet and ubiquitous access to technology from very early on in development and their significant developmental years, um, which is especially the preteens and adolescents, they have this stuff present. So there's some unique challenges to that. Because even if like, Gen X or baby boomers are using technology, absolutely it's integrated into one's life, but their brains developed without that actually first present. So it was, in, it was introduced later. Another thing to be aware of, uh, probably not gonna be surprised to uh, all of you, but uh, most people with addictions have more than one area, substance or behavior that they're at least struggling with compulsivity around. So there's often multiple addictions going on. That's really important in the context of this um, uh, this presentation and, um, and, and, and note that, uh, substance addictions are often the most externally visible issue. Like you can see it from the outside, parents, loved ones, friends, family partners will be able to see it much more often. Technology and behavior-based addictions are much easier to hide. And, and, and they're also frequently not asked about in substance focused settings. There's a whole load of reasons why that is. Uh, I won't go into all of them, but one of them is familiarity and comfort. People want to work with what they know. But substances are the things that are more, more alarming and tend to take attention first. And um, also uh, people who don't incorporate that piece into their lens and don't have uh, an education or exposure to working with process addiction often don't know how to sniff it out. Because I think like the nose of being able to sniff out that something's off is like a big part of addictions counseling. Like being able to be like, mm, you know, I'm kind of smelling BS or there's something happening here that's a little off. I think that's harder when one has been working with substances and less with process addictions. By the way, an assumption within this presentation is I made this presentation um, with kind of the audience, the target audience being like, people who have more experience, let's say, with substance and mental health treatment, because that tends to be what people have exposure to within their education and their training. And they just tend to see more clients in more diverse settings with those issues. So I'm not going to cover a ton about the substance piece, because I think the process addiction piece is what is trickier for people. So that's just kind of a 
an operating assumption that I'm going off of. And then the internet and technology have changed how we live, right? Access points are uh, everywhere. You can't, like one typically can't simply cut this stuff out of their lives. So, uh, you know, with alcohol, one could set up a life where one is not exposed to it very often. With technology, that's not really that possible, at least not without some significant negative consequences to one's life. So um, this is also probably not going to be a surprise. There tends to be a high rate of relapse amongst uh, those under 35. Early exposure is one of the strongest predictors of difficulty in maintaining sobriety. Basically, like the earlier one is exposed to a process addiction or a, or a substance addiction, often the harder it is for them to maintain continuous abstinence or sobriety as they launch into their recovery. Um, I talked about the more integrated relationship with technology. I won't touch on that again. I repeated it a couple of times just for uh, retention, but um, I, won't, I won't touch on that further here. But And then um, frequent return to use, which is also sometimes what's called relapse in the substance world. Um, Oh, I guess in the addiction world in general, or relapse can leave clients and therapists feeling kind of pretty therapeutically discouraged sometimes. Like, hey, like this is not working. Like, is this a fit for this person? Am I the right fit for this person? So that's a, a legitimate factor uh, of, of what makes it more complicated and difficult. And then um, we talked about this a little bit ago that because of the lack of awareness of nuance of what process addictions can look like, it's just harder to spot for a lot of folks. Okay, so why is sobriety generally harder for younger generations? Um, when I say harder, I'm not saying that it's just hard for them because it's hard for any person launching into uh, recovery, typically most people, right? But there's there are some additional challenges. And some of those are that there's more of a perception that I'm more time to get this right. The stakes can feel like they're lower. And, um, and, and, and there's a there's this like a momentum from their usage of these things that they're carrying into their early treatment, right? Often people have more limited resources when they're younger. Often they are uh, dependent on parents, family to financially support them entering um, even outpatient treatment. And um, there are practical experiential reasons like uh, resources that they lack and uh, interpersonal, intrapersonal resource, resources within themselves. They're just less life experience and know less about themselves. I talked about the younger generations being an experimental cohort, developing with technology around. That's a really, it's a big deal, right? And um, there's, a, there's a much greater normalization of substance screen and tech-based addictions. Uh, there's, um, I'll, I'll talk about it again in a little bit. There's generally more awareness around addiction and mental health amongst millennials and Gen Z. It's much more incorporated into the media we consume, uh, conversations between friends, um, information is much more readily available at our fingertips. And so that increased awareness can actually sometimes result in a lower urgency to do something about it. Maybe some of you have seen this in clients, like there's some uh, clients who have a high degree of awareness, but their ability to behaviorally take action and follow through is much lower. And they kind of use awareness as like, well, I'm naming it, I'm talking about it, I'm putting it out here. And like, that's the extent of it. Like there isn't as much of an ability to follow through on the difficult actions, right? Another piece is, you know, technology literacy makes setting up like deterrent barriers harder, whether it be you know, locking up gaming devices or um, with like pornography addiction, setting up uh, accountability software, you know, things like, you know, Bark or Canine or um, Net Nanny or Covenant Eyes. These are all popular kind of uh, accountability software platforms. But the thing is like for millennials and Gen Z, like if they want to get, it's, it's, it's like a joke to get around these filters. Like you have so many devices, um, They'll, they'll find the avenues, even on the locked device. And I'll, so I'll talk about that in a little bit on, on, on how to approach that. And then FOMO, right? Like the fear of missing out is much stronger amongst younger generations. Um, and, and so what we're talking about here is like, I feel like if they get into recovery early that they're missing out on a lot of stuff. This is common in substance addiction where they're like, hey, like I'm not gonna be able to like 
you know, experience going out with my friends and drinking or using and partying and go to the, going to these like, you know, raves or festivals, which is like a legit thing. There's a loss for them there. Uh, but also with technology, there's like this, am I going to miss out on the content that's available out there? Am I going to have to have a different relationship to my phone? Am I going to miss out on these awesome video games that are coming out? Right. Those are all real factors. So some further obstacles um, we talked about there being a high likelihood of co-occurring addictions, right? I, I'm repeating this. Some of the content here is repeated on purpose. And, um, and, and, and even one addiction being maintained can actually put the other ones at risk. So that's where sometimes like just a linear approach of like, or in sequence approach of let's just address the thing that's going to kill you first, which is a sound approach, which often has led people to addressing their substance piece first. Well, the co-occurring existence, if these things are woven together, something like a pornography addiction or video game addiction or screen addiction, staying alive while one addresses a substance just puts that other work at risk, similar to what we saw in the vignette where the client addressed the substance piece, but in IOP, they started gaming again and their cravings for substances went up, right? So just be aware of that, of just the, the, the in-sequence kind of Right, sequential approach won't necessarily work with all of these clients. Um, there's also decreased relatability and experience to peers, depending on kind of the treatment and mutual support group setting. The research showed that once they get into those settings, that relatability is actually very high. So just, but there's a perceived external lack of relatability, as in, hey, if I go to this mutual support group meeting, such as, you know, like AA or SAA, or if I go to, you know, recovery dharma, if I go to life ring, people are not going to, I'm not going to be able to relate to them. They're not going to understand me. I'm, they're older than me or you know, whatever, stuff like that, right? And then hormone, hormone levels are a very real factor uh, for sobriety. They can make sobriety more challenging, um, especially for males or those transitioning female to male who are receiving hormone replacement therapy. Um, I think we sometimes dismiss that or don't talk about that biological piece. Uh, one of the things is higher testosterone levels do. Testosterone is associated with like risk taking and impulsivity. Like it's that's part of how it functions. It also raises libido really significantly. Um, that's also experienced for like you know TRT testosterone replacement therapy has become much more common now. You know where people who say hey I've got levels of like low T often hear talk about as low T and they go to see a you know a prescriber who gets them started on testosterone replacement. And one of the first things that a lot of folks, well, a lot of patients indicate is a significant increase in their libido, which may be totally beneficial for a lot of people, but in the context of like maintaining sobriety around, let's say porn addiction, much harder, increased impulsivity around, hey, like generally that's going up and my phone's right here. I can just reach for it and download this game, right? It, it, it makes it harder. And then um, this varies by gender, uh, but Brain development, uh, typically not complete. Uh, females kind of are, are ahead of the males oftentimes in brain development where there's more complete development by early to mid twenties. And for males, it's like mid twenties, 26, 27 for more complete development of one's brain. So those are all factors. Um, so millennials and Gen Z are pretty similar. They have a lot of overlap. Um, but they have some, you know, cultural divergences from each other. Um, and uh, one of the things to note is that millennials are fully tech integrated, meaning it's like an integrated part of our lives and woven into almost every uh, bit of it. And we had early exposure. But the truth with Gen Z is that Gen Z are tech natives, right? As in they've never known a world without modern technology, right? Like the high-speed internet has always pretty much existed for them, right? So, and that's a very different experience. And um, when I say that, like it, 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 it's an important and significant cultural point, folks, because suggesting the idea of, um, hey, like living or even putting constraints around one's technology is similar to like someone telling you like, hey, like, let's use electricity less in your life. Like let's turn, not turn on lights on as much or charge things. And you may be like, well, that's not really, that doesn't feel like an option. In truth, like it is an option. You don't need to turn on lights. You don't need to plug stuff in. 
but there is that initial barrier that one is going to encounter because it's an assumption, a cultural assumption of our lives. Uh, what I put up here is like, hey, how many of you, you know, did you stop to consider that electricity, let's say, you know, is a privilege in your life, right? You probably treat it like a modern, uh, like it's, a, you know, walk into my office and I'm going to be able to turn the lights on and plug my computer in and access this webinar. I certainly did. And that's the way to think about it. That's how millennials and Gen Z tend to think about technology. It's a given. It's a part of our lives. <clears throat> so some other considerations, and then we'll move into kind of the solution here in just a little bit, but am I doing on time? Uh, they'll often search online for the solution to this problem. And uh, although this can be helpful, like people going on like subreddits for recovery from, you know, video game addiction, or porn addiction, or even substance addiction. Although that's great and create like an initial entry point and uh, greater acceptance, lowering of shame, all of those things that are beneficial to people. But it's also where the problem lives for people with those types of process addictions, right? And so it's really easy to also like just take a right turn or left turn and end up in your, uh, like, you know, it's like, it's like, hey, I was intending to go to the meeting and right next to the meeting is the bar kind of thing, right? And so uh, falling into traditional structured or a linear path to recovery can feel like kind of burdensome adulting to these generations. So it can make recovery feel really heavy. And it's like a part of like the, uh, there's sometimes, uh, I'm not gonna call it a resistance. I think the, the idea of like growing up into adulthood holds a lot less glamor for millennials and Gen Z. Um, adolescence in a lot of ways has been extended. I think the timeline for all sorts of generations has been extended. Adolescence, I think for, millennials went till 25 like you're kind of like in your late teens at age 25 and if people look at that they're you know their family their children themselves they can often see the signs of that because the like i said there's just been an extension and that started way before the millennials like look at the look at the baby boomers for example like the baby boomers like my grandparents who were you know from kind of the old world they were from the middle east or from armenian but they were uh, from lebanon and, you know, someone in their 70s um, or 75, like they were old. They like were having trouble walking. They, you know, it was like, it felt like the end of life, right? Like very much. And now like 75 year olds are like fit and living and a bunch of them are working or like only semi-retired. So it's a very different experience around the shifting of this timeline. So it's affected younger generations too. Um and then they're more critical of frameworks for approaching this stuff. They'll do research online of does this work or that work? And um, and then they'll review programs. So just they're more informed consumers and sometimes more skeptical. And then um, uh, their media consumption habits. Interestingly, it's not just true for millennials and Gen Z, but for people in general. What research has demonstrated is that your media consumption habits in your teenage years often are a strong indicator of how you're going to continue to consume media and technology. So that number, uh, like, let's say, hey, I use my phone and screens for like nine hours a day in my adolescence. Well, that's probably going to be the strongest predictor of what it looks like when you're 47. Okay, now just transitioning here to um, well, addressing the issue. By the way, I'm just going to pause just for a sec and ask Tara and Ali anything that came up, like as far as technical issues, questions, anything I'm not touching on. We have some questions in the Q&A, but we're going to hit those at the end, I believe. So, okay. um, and no technical uh, issues that I can see. So. Right. We did, we did go ahead and Ali sent the, the deck to everyone so you guys can download that. Um, but other than that, I think we're good. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. So a preview of kind of the stops on the train. One is assessing, uh, missing an S there. Uh, so assess for multiple addictions and we'll look at assessment avenues, tools around that area. Reframing our clinical expectations and our clinical uh, lens. So that so like shifting how we're viewing the issue and problem and like broadening out, right? That's what that section is often about. Uh, also like expanding beyond addiction, it touches on that as well. 
but uh, supporting them in developing like something to stay sober for. That's like a big factor for younger generations is like, you know, the why. We Many of us know like when a, when a person ourselves or others have like a strong why we're doing something, it makes the what and the how so much more impactful. And when we're not connected to our why, the the hows and the whats often don't last, right? And uh, exploring the relationship that people have with screens and technology uh, is something we'll touch on as well. And then talking about higher level of care and collaboration as kind of the last stop on the train. Okay, uh, so uh, in this section on assessments, one of the things that I've done is I've included a bunch of different assessments that are available for screen addictions, video game addiction, pornography addiction, sex addiction, hypersexual behavior, intimacy disorders. Um, and um, uh, I did not include substance assessments because honestly, those are much easier to find. Find any of your colleagues who may work or that may be you who work in uh, SUD treatment and ask them about what the kind of common assessments are. They're very available. Uh, online and well-documented and researched. So as far as the assessments go, I'm not going to go through and bore you all and be like, here's this assessment and here's how it breaks down. Like that's, I'm going to lose people. Um, and so I'll kind of touch on them briefly and skirt over those. So this is probably the most boring section of all of them, but relevant. And at the end of the slide deck, I've got links for all of those assessments that are available as open source. Some of them require specialized training and some of them are through, like require uh, a membership in that organization, let's say, to be able to access. Okay, okay so one of the things that I really, uh, this is a very important point here, um, is operating off the assumption that your clients have multiple addictions and that you aren't aware of all of them. Like if that, that's a safe operating assumption to go in with because it makes us ask questions. And if it, if it should be that, that they don't, then that's okay. It actually kind of simplified things. And I didn't leave something out that uh, might be harmful to the process or it kind of impede the process as we go along, right? And I've said this also, um, if you work in a primary SUD or mental health setting, if you work in a um, substance addiction setting, um, having this as like part of the language and the framework is really helpful and huge. So what does this look like? Telling clients, hey, we're not just addressing your cannabis addiction. We want to look at all ways in which, you know, your brain is trying to find dopamine in a compulsive or addictive way. So like putting that into the paperwork, the operating assumption of your yourself, staff, and the way that you may conduct your assessments in private practice, like incorporating that into that early introduction of it, because then what it sets up is that it, it changes the frame for you being able to pursue those avenues of conversation with them as they come up. Because if we're just down this one lane, clients may come in and say, I'm just here to address my alcoholism. I'm not here to talk about like, like you'll almost meet resistance when it comes to looking at their pornography addiction or their video game addiction. Cause they're like, that's not the identified thing. That's not what you and I are doing here. But if from the beginning it's, Hey, let's expand this out. It can really save you and the client a lot of friction later. Um, and then uh, consider incorporating more global screening tools into your intake process, right? Some of the assessments that I, that I uh, will be including in a little bit. Um, and uh as far as your information gathering, ask about, hey, are there any other behaviors that you think may be you know, compulsive, addictive, or eating more of your lunch than you would like them to? If frequent relapse is occurring uh, with uh, any given addiction, um, and there's a sense that there's a missing puzzle piece, it's time to expand your lens. This happens both ways, right? Sometimes I work with people in a process addiction setting, and they're having like these, what seem like sometimes these relapses, but I'm, I feel like I'm only getting part of the information from them. Like mm, there's something missing. And then I start asking, you know, I start incorporating, asking more stuff about substances, even though I may have asked before, let's explore that piece. Let's explore uh, your relationship to food as well, right? So expanding your lens out 
when there's a sense that they're relapsing frequently and you're missing something. Uh, I talked about how substance use disorders are the most visible and they're often what bring people in through the door and they'll be the most visible one. And, uh, you know, normalize the brain looking for dopamine and adrenaline where it can get it. Like, hey, these other addictions are not in some special box or category. You may have more than one way that your brain has learned to, you know, create this for yourself and trying to help ourselves, right? Um, and then ask about peripherals to their primary addictions, like um, encouraging them, let's say, to break down a night of smoking or drinking or using or, you know, even acting out with pornography or uh, contacting, you know, sex workers or um, uh, gaming, right? The Like in the vignette that we talked about in the beginning, that information was gathered by really like breaking down exactly what they're doing. And the question that I like to ask in that area, and this is something some of you may be familiar with is, hey, if like a, if you were on like a reality TV show and there was like a documentary camera crew following you around during your day, what raw footage would they get? What would they observe you doing? What would end up on that camera? Like ask them to break that down. That often gets them more aware. Okay? So some screen and technology, um, screening tools and assessments, the GAINS short screener uh, talks about a whole bunch of areas actually. That's why it's like globally, it's very helpful. So it's like your broad net assessment. Uh, includes stuff on substances, food, screens, sexuality. Um, the technology, the uh, technology addiction screening tool. It's a shorter one and looks at more than one type of tech addiction. And the CIUS, so the Compulsive Internet Use Scale, is a well-respected one in the world of um, of uh, uh, screen addictions, and um, it it looks at levels of compulsivity gives you kind of a readout of that. And the mobile phone problematic use scale is a less known one. It's specific to mobile phones. And so it's, it's a validated measure, but it's specific to like handheld phone use, right? And then the cage, for those of you who are familiar with the cage from the substance treatment world, which is like a, a set of four questions, right? Which is like, have you ever thought about cutting down, right? On your drinking or using, um, has anyone ever been annoyed at your drinking or use? Um, have you ever felt guilty about, you know, your drinking? And have you ever had uh, an eye opener, right? And so those pieces can be adopted actually to screen addictions, asking about the same thing, you know, Ex except for the eye opener. The last one I think is the least applicable because how many of you did not look at your devices kind of within the first two minutes of waking up? Okay, the VGAT um, is, is, is one that looks at um, uh, video game addictions. So now we're in the gaming section. Um, the problematic online gaming questionnaire uh, is, is more nuanced than looking at levels of disruption and interference of people's lives versus like a yes or no setup. So it gives more data. The uh, IGD-20 is based off of the, um, uh, the, the uh, diagnostic criteria within the DSM-5, for those of you who looked at the addiction section of the DSM-5, at the end of it, there is this like diagnosis, diagnoses for further consideration or research, basically the stuff that doesn't have adequate enough research to be included, but had some and was like kind of these proposed potential diagnoses for them to keep an eye on. Well, um, internet gaming disorder was one of them on there. So it's based off of that uh, criteria of the APA. And then the GASA is helpful for adolescents in particular. So we get into the intimacy disorders. So sex addiction, porn addiction, sexual compulsivity. And by the way, I'm aware that there's probably a broad spectrum of people attending here that the term sex addiction itself is charged and controversial. Some people believe in it and have seen it within their work have experience with it within their lives. Some people are like, hey, it's something that's created by the kind of the puritanical roots of our culture and a kind of a dated framework that results in compulsivity due to shame and other factors. The, the point is when we talk about this piece, you know, call it, you know, sexual compulsivity, if that's what you uh, wanna frame it as, 
and which is, you know, technically a little bit different than addiction. We won't go into that, but I want to just be like, you know, sensitive and inclusive to more than one lens and framework around this stuff. Um, so the sex addiction screening test, uh, the SAS, as it's better known, was developed by the uh, International Institute for Trauma and Addiction Professionals. That's the, the body that certifies, trains and certifies the CSATs, which is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a certified sex addiction therapist. Um, and so that's who it was developed through. It's a one through 20 score. And it, it's a screening that looks at addiction. It's available for free. If you go online uh, through the ITAP website, you can access the SAST. There's the pathos screening. I won't go through all the letters of it, but that also looks at um, sexual compulsivity. And the uh, the SDI and the SDMI are two assessments. They're much longer. They take about two hours to complete. So they take a deep dive into sexual compulsivity and the co-occurring issues of, and, and um, consequences that they're causing within a person's life. They're designed to leave no stone unturned. The SDI and the SDMI must be administered typically uh, by a CSAT, by a certified sex addiction therapist, or by a CSAT in training or an ASAT, right? Um, that's because it's a it's a paid assessment um, uh, that requires access to the platform that it's administered from. And within the SDI actually is the SAS, the sex addiction screening test is with embedded within the SDI as well. And this gives you a pretty good readout of the levels of preoccupation, areas of behavior, basically what's, what, what they're thinking about and may not be acting on yet. And um, it's, it's, it's typically used for people entering uh, treatment around um, compulsive sexual behavior. So the hypersexual behavior inventory, it looks at similarly looking at it from just like this hypersexual behavior lens versus uh, addiction. And uh, it also breaks down thought, stuff on thoughts, fantasies, behaviors, kind of teasing some of that out. And the CSBI, the World Health Organization has adopted um, uh, compulsive sexual behavior as one of the diagnoses or diagnoses within their uh, the ICD-11. And uh, there's this assessment is based off those criteria. There's some special considerations within that criteria, folks, such as like, like teens don't get diagnosed with it, even though they may be demonstrating high levels of compulsivity. So there's some stuff to be aware of and get some training on around that. Okay, we made it through the assessment section. Whew. Thanks for hanging in there. I know that's kind of dry. Um, that's why you came, right? You wanted to talk about dry assessments, I'm sure. Um, but the other piece here is, you know, learning to play well with others is one of the stops on the train. So we can't be experts in everything and trying to do so would spread our focus like pretty thin and can actually like sometimes end up being um, uh, work against us. And so in that way, like incorporating uh, other clinicians and resources into our care can be really helpful. Uh, prior to completely referring somebody out, Consider a multi-clinician approach. Uh, I have gotten uh, contacts or calls from sub, uh, from clinicians who work primarily with substance issues and they want me to kind of assess and also um, incorporate formulation of like a care plan around, let's say their uh, screen addictions or sexual compulsivity. And, uh, um, and, and, and sometimes they can come see us, you know, one and the other every other week for like a period of like four months until we can formulate a, a plan that works and get them kind of rolling on stuff. Even a short time spent with someone who is a subject matter expert, them working with somebody else who let's say may specialize in treating screen addictions can shift the thinking uh, and framework of the client. And what can happen is uh, that kind of through a backdoor channel, the client is almost sometimes educating us on what they heard from this therapist or on how to approach it. So it can, it can really help us in our lens and approach to for them to be working with this other piece uh, person. So we're, it's like we're getting this like indirect education on part of what works. Consultation, of course, with a specialist is can be hugely beneficial. It can open up new doors or avenues. And it's an opportunity to like up one's game around um, treating this stuff in general. And plus, it's just like really interesting. It keeps things fresh to consult with someone who knows more about this new thing or, or this area that's kind of new for us. 
And then of course, when cost is a factor, one can get creative, like incorporating support from those who are still in training, uh, finding clinicians who are covered, let's say by the client's insurance provider. And um, let's say, hey, they've got, um, they've got a co-occurring screen addiction or they've got a co-occurring pornography addiction. Well, because those are not officially recognized, they're not gonna be able to find coverage through an insurance provider typically on that specific issue. But if they've got a substance uh, addiction, well, I'm an LAC, I'm a licensed addictions counselor, so I can work with substance as well. They can come see me for that, for example, and uh, and 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 indirectly where we end up talking about their pornography addiction and incorporating that into the fold, right? So that's a creative way to kind of get around some of those things. If you find a clinician who knows about it, who can um, kind of bill under another primary diagnosis, right? All right. Um, so reframing our expectations and adjusting our clinical lens. Uh, I think this is just generally true, but it's just worth mentioning, right? Which is accepting the reality that like, um, they're gonna experience frequent relapses and returns to use, right? And their relapses are not in our control. They're not our doing. Sometimes we have this false impression, especially if we're like skilled and more experienced within this work that we can like, you know, I'm not, almost no one would agree to this when I say it out loud, like, hey, do you agree with the statement? But we can feel it on the inside of us. And I was like, I can't keep people sober. I'm not the one who's gonna like do the work for them and figure this stuff out. And so just know that you are not in control of what's happening with them ultimately, right? Um, and uh, I'll say the last piece associated with this, which is, you know, falling forward is progress. Someone, you know, discovering something new as they do it, changing, tweaking this one piece, adding this additional part, like it's this process of falling forward. And that's often what it looks like, folks, especially in the process addiction world. Ongoing sobriety from the jump, from the start, is rare in addiction treatment in general, right? I think mean, what happens is people look at like, hey, here's like the one in 15 who was able to do that right from the beginning. That's who everyone wants to strive to be. But that's there's a reason why they're one in 15. And what I've learned within the process addiction space is that one in 15 sometimes just had a secondary addiction to fall back on. And that's why maintaining their sobriety around this other thing seemed easier for them relatively speaking, not to be dismissive of their work, right? And then determine if abstinence is the right model, right? I think this is true uh, generally within North America. North America has a strong allegiance to the abstinence model, which I don't necessarily disagree with. Like, I think there's a lot of value to that and it's a fit for a lot of folks. Uh, I tend to skew that way myself. And yet there are there is more than one model and the harm reduction model isn't just this thing of like, oh, like that's kind of harm reduction is like the you know, kind of the compromise, like C plus level of recovery that we get into. And it feels like, and that's not necessarily true, folks. Um, harm reduction, it can be hugely helpful on a number of different ways, right? One, it can improve the quality of life for people quite a bit, which increases their desire, their motivation around their why, which can lead them to abstinence as well. So it can help in that way. Two, the abstinence model, if someone is shooting to achieve that and is continuously having slips or relapses, well, you're undermining the value of the abstinence model anyway, because they're saying, hey, this doesn't work or I can't work it or it doesn't work for me. So be aware of that, like being like black and white, dedicated to this is the only model that exists and it's cut out everything all together all at once, right from the jump or, or, or it doesn't work, like that may be harming what you're actually trying to achieve here right? Just something to be considerate of. And um, the dialectical model, which is uh, available, if you look at the second, um, the uh, volume two, uh, I'm sorry, second edition of the DBT uh, uh, workbook and uh, handouts book, uh, this is Marsha Linehan's model, which incorporates the best of the abstinence model and the harm reduction model together. That's my preferred model, the dialectical model. So if you're interested in finding out more about it, Go, you know, uh, look up if you have access to the handbook somewhere, the workbook, or, you know, as we say, you know, give it a goog, you know, look it up on Google and see what you find. <clears throat> uh, consider uh, an establishing sobriety group where people are talking about more than one addiction. And this can help with 
kind of the sense of uh, traumatization and reinforcement of core beliefs that some people experience around, hey, like I'm not, I, I keep falling, other people are doing better than me. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it, 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 it's a good entry level container to get people started and just boost their awareness around what, what's going on. Because part of what can happen in groups, if the younger group members are frequently relapsing, one, comparatively, they start to feel distant. And then two, um, what it does is it can actually be harmful to people who are less ambivalent and more stable within their recovery. That's something that's been seen in group research. That's why people don't mix uh, groups with differing levels of motivation. Individuals with vastly differing levels of motivation in one group is attempt to hold the people who are um, more motivated back. It doesn't tend to pull the ones who are less motivated forward, actually. And so uh, the other one is sobriety sampling. Actually, instead of being like, hey, like, you know, we're going to be sober for good off all, each of these things is have them sample like, hey, let's take 30 days away from video games and just see what happens. Or let's discover what some of your areas of craving or the blocks are, right? It could be true for substances. It could be true for screens. It could be true for pornography. And that is a good way to get people rolling on certain things. And again, make it feel more manageable and work with ambivalence, right? And then depending on their age, you know, kind of where they're at, their stage of life, their personal situation, like I said, quality of life, improvement of quality of life can be like the primary goal. So if you're helping someone in those dimensions and areas, it may be that reframe that like your treatment is effective. It's touching on each of these areas. And know that this is going to be a long-term incremental improvement or process, right? Within addiction, it's common where people seek some level of treatment when they're at a certain stage. And then they sometimes you know, go back to some degree, but in a reduced capacity, they're using, acting out, being you know hooked on their phone. You are likely not going to be the only stop on their train. Just keep that like kind of in a narrative of what it's going to look like. You're maybe stop one or two on like six stops that they're going to have throughout their life around this issue. And then, of course, taking care of yourself as you take care of others, right? I think that's something important for me to remind myself of and divorcing ourselves from outcomes. Look at the time here, um, be conscious. We don't have too, too long left. So, so developing something to stay sober for, we talked about like, hey, the why, this is what it's about. What motivational interviewing, ACT, DBT, mutual support group programs often use values as a powerful, like orienting and motivating factor. They're a very strong ev uh, evocative force for change. And so helping people discover this, um, uh, is, 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 is hugely beneficial. It can also help you not just feel stuck around like, hey, all we're addressing is this like continuous relapse that's occurring. It can give you something else to kind of chew on together within your therapeutic work. So menus are often helpful for this. So looking at like values, menus, needs, like you can go print off stuff, right? And helping them discover what these things are, having them articulate these. Vision boards are great exercises for them being able to put this stuff and like kind of conceptualize it tangibly a little bit more. Uh, like visualization, manifestation in that way, really also helpful if they're like a visual person to be able to kind of put themselves into that. So these can really help them cement more of their why and give you a better idea of what their why is and what gets them moving. Um, so check-ins within groups or individual work where you look at, hey, how are you doing on what we call outer circle, right? In the uh, intimacy disorder space like those are like the activities that orient us towards a life of healthy living and so how are you doing on pursuing these are in what way are you incorporating them into your life how many of them did you do this last week right and um, you can even like reinforce this through like some regular check-ins accountability from peers and goals that they're setting around hitting some of these things in any given week and uh, know that like entry into recovery and early maintenance of it is often motivated by relationships. I say this generally, like within the addiction space, I think sometimes we ask people, you know, are you doing this for yourself? I think that's a totally legit question, super important. And yet what tons of research and probably your practical experience has demonstrated is that most people enter treatment due to taxed relationships with loved ones or from a nudge or push from people around them. I think one of the mistakes we've made is we framed some of that as codependency from others. 
And that's like, that's not how, you know, we're not wired uh, for it, as human beings, we're wired for connection. I'm not saying codependency is not real and can't be a factor for people. It absolutely can be, but um, don't be too quick to get them disconnected from that surge of motivation that's coming from their family or loved ones. Actually help them utilize the energy of that. And yes, they eventually need to shift to what are your reasons in discovering their why, but part of their why may be their family and their relationships right now. So I just will wanted to say that. So assessing like the quality, the number of uh, nature of relationships that they have uh, and, and looking at like generally their attachment style, uh, completing a genogram can give you a good idea of what that looks like. So what it, it gives you is like this like three dimensional view and gives them th a three dimensional awareness of what do my relationships look like, right? And again, there's a strong discovery of whys within that as kind of socially oriented uh, beings and um, and then new connections outside of their friend group uh, is key especially this is true for adolescents folks in their early 20s people hanging out with friends and people who are still in some way um, uh, enabling of the addictive framework and mindset is a very real factor and it's something that a lot of folks who work in substance treatment for example know about right and so ask them about their group of friends who they're hanging out with, what that looks like. All right, exp expanding beyond addiction. Um, and uh, we talked about uh, co-occurring addictions often happening. Well, most people with addictions, regardless of age or generation, struggle with co-occurring mental health disorders. So that's like a very real thing. A addressing mental health at the same focus level as substance abuse, sex addiction, screen addiction, which the SA fits for, um, is critical. Uh, especially for younger generations who have this like brain development disadvantage in that like their brains may not be be totally developed yet, right based on the age that you're working with them at and so uh i think that in the substance world where uh i'm sorry in the addiction world we're often we're sometimes guilty of like focusing on the addiction piece and treating the mental health piece as this ancillary thing that's like secondary we may not that may be because we don't know a ton about it that's not part of our lens we don't Maybe we're in recovery and we don't have that issue. So we just don't sniff it out as much. But not addressing this piece with the same level of energy, especially for people with complex co-occurring factors, is like like good luck, is what I'm gonna say. It's gonna, you're gonna be hitting your head against the wall a lot, and so are they. So the same level of focus, integrating the care as much as possible. Often the frontal lobe deficit related and impulse control related issues are prominent in the you know the multiple addiction co-occurring uh, substances and screens component. So looking for ADHD, uh, dyslexia, which co-occurs co a lot with ADHD, a bipolar disorder or cyclothymia, uh, anger management issues, um, uh, impulse control disorders, and then generalized anxiety and panic all of these tend to affect impulsivity within the frontal lobe which when you look at that um creates some of the very same things that addiction is based in right so the breaking system oftentimes is is deficient and um so if uh if if you assess and there's more than one addiction going on talk about referring out to a certified multiple addiction therapist or we talked about playing well with others, that can be really huge and helpful incorporating that piece. Another thing worth mentioning, I just like throw it out there and I'm not dispensing medical advice to people here around uh, what, what they encourage clients to look into, but naltrexone uh, is really an underutilized medication. Some of you may be familiar with it. Um, there is the, uh, there's the depot, like injected intramuscular version of it, which is called Vivitrol. It's used quite a bit in the substance treatment world. Well, naltrexone it has been demonstrated to work with substance and process addictions. So, and it can be around like, you know, uh, compulsivity around food, gambling, video games, pornography. Uh, so it is massively underutilized, I would say, uh, because it's not well known in the process addiction world in particular. Of course, they got to take it under the advisement of a psychiatrist because there can be hepatic concerns that can affect their liver. So people have to take like do some blood draws where they look at, hey, is it negatively impacting my, uh, they have to look at their liver function tests 
But if they're tolerating it well, it can be really hugely helpful in the first couple of years of, of recovery. And if, if they struggle with medication adherence, the depot medication, the injected version is available um, and, and uh, something that some people utilize. So uh, some of the mental health factors um, and kind of psychosocial factors, um, such as like life skills, and uh, we talked about that adulting, can manifest for Gen Z and millennials uh, who appear, who present well at your office, but within their lives and how they're, you know, addressing like and, and, and living the amount of stress they're creating with themselves. They're kind of um, struggling more, they're lower functioning than you may actually see. So ask about that piece. Become curious and help them break down the nitty gritty of how they're living, right? And again, expanding out these other additional pieces. An activity tracker, even for a couple of days, can help them become aware of it. An app that reminds them to like log what they're doing and what they did today. And like I said, it's an opportunity to up your game as far as mental health skills go and um, and maybe including a clinician on the team or a coach who uh, adds in that piece, right? ADHD coaches, life skills coaching, someone who does like hands-on work with adolescents can be really, really helpful and, 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 and add in that missing piece for people. And then it's generally exploring their relationships with screen and technology, right? We talked about these two generations often being very like tech integrated um, and, uh, you know, saying, hey, like the idea of using their phone less, putting a filter on, um, stepping away from video games, reducing their computer use, know that this can feel punitive to them. Like it's a punishment that they, I don't get to do this thing. Uh, and, and, and they'll often have fear of missing out. So help them grieve this, right? Talk about, let them talk about their feelings, validate that piece around, yeah, it is a change around technology use. And yes, it's about more about what am I going to get in return for it, which is so much more, but to be dismissive of the grief that arises, we do it at their detriment and ours. And this is, I think, known, well-known in the substance world. Often people are grieving the loss of their addiction to like, you know, their the drug or the bottle. And it's a good sign when it comes up because it means the person is actually considering closing their door or else the grief would not arise. And so uh, it applies to technology too. Uh, assess and understand uh, their relationship to it. Take a deep dive and talk about, you know, that activity tracker. How much do you use your phone? What do you use it for? Is it often in your hands, right? Um, know that heavy use is the norm now. So they may tell you, oh yeah, normal. That's okay. Tell me what normal is. Tell me what you do with it. Uh, ask for collaterals. Hey, would a friend or family member of yours be willing to come into a session and tell us a little bit about what this looks like for you, right? Kind of gathering that additional data around what their actual relationship to screens look like, right? And um, uh, as far as like video game addiction, screen addictions, just want to throw it out there to plug it because it's just, it's a really great resource. There's a program called Restart in Seattle. Uh, Dr. Hillary Cash is the clinical director there. They really work with a lot of these various co-occurring issues that we named today. They do substance work, screen addictions work. Most people go there for like video game addiction, screen addiction, but they do process addiction work like uh, pornography addiction too. And so they're great, especially for that early adult, emerging adult uh, population. And uh, and they have some transitional living options too, which is, you know, great. And then know that, you know, switching between various devices is still screen time. Maybe like, oh, I don't use my phone much, but they hop on a tablet and their computer. Yeah. So let me look at where we're at. Um, so unless it's strongly requested for safety by like a partner, for example, um, I, I mentioned this more in the intimacy disorder space and pornography addiction space. Like, you know, there was this thing we did as CSATs. This was this happened more like 10 years ago, five years ago, 15 years ago, but they'd be like, hey, get a flip phone for six months or a year and or, or, or more, you know, and at least there's no internet on it and you won't be tempted to like blah, blah, blah. And, Folks, this is not a realistic intervention for like modern times. Uh, like just even jobs require two-factor authentication that comes onto your phone, right? And, uh, and, 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 and it is, it's strange. And people will ask about it. The moment I see like a millennial with a flip phone, I'm like, what is that? What are you doing? You know, what, like it, it'll, it'll result in a lot of questions. So it's often largely incompatible with modern life. So it's not really an effective or realistic intervention. Know that you can actually help people dumb down smartphones pretty easily. You can go watch some YouTube videos on it. 
on how to install like filtering and accountability software on there. People can remove a lot of the applications that are not native to like iOS or Android devices. iOS devices, Apple devices are easier to lock down actually. So removing things like, uh, they can like kind of make it bare bones like where they have the um, messaging application, weather, clock, calculator, uh, and then a lot of the things that are third party that they downloaded are, are removed. And that's the things that have access, internet access to them, right? So just be aware that you can dumb down smartphones. Uh, you can lock up the App Store. You can lock up Safari. Um, in early recovery with millennials and Gen Z, asking them to install a filtration device is going to backfire. One, I told you all they can get around it. Two, it, re it results in a rat trying to get to the cheese or the mouse trying to get to the cheese. It results in intermittent reinforcement, right? Hey, it's kind of what happens with like slot machines. I pull it, I pull it, nothing happens, nothing happens, nothing happens. And in no predictable way or pattern, I get this big payoff. That is the most powerful reinforcer known in the neuroscientific world. And that's what you're going to be setting up with a filter. Oh, I can't get around it, can't get around it, can't get around it. Oh, I found a way around it. Boom. Big dopamine payoff for the brain. You're actually like helping create um, more addiction. And then last piece, right? Higher level of care and structure. Some people are too progressed within their illness and what they need is somewhere with a longer level of you know, care, uh, longer uh, length of stay. And neurophysiologically, their brains need to adjust and detach. And that takes more than a couple of weeks sometimes, right? Um, it's also part of why, like at Begin Again, we don't accept clients under 25 because we know the two week window is not often effective for them. There's other options within our care network that can accommodate that, but like it's like begin again is not the right spot, uh, the, the two week intensive. Um, know that Gen Z and millennials thrive on, uh, thrive on frequent feedback and letting them know, you know, what they're pursuing within their work and pursuits is valuable, that they're making progress and incorporating this into their recovery is really, really helpful, right? And um, help them create a schedule put it together with them because structure is really helpful for younger generations and it helps you, gives you that visibility on what their day-to-day -day life looks like. And um, often it's within the chaos of a lack of structure that these multiple addictions are coexisting. And then being more hands-on is helpful with younger generations, right? I get that, hey, like I'm not doing this for them, but looking at things that you typically feel like you don't talk about with clients like, tell me about your bedtime. Tell me about, you know, what it looks like to move through your day. And do you put a planner together? And what does that look like? And asking and involving those hands-on pieces um, are hugely helpful. Let me take a breath. I feel like I haven't taken a breath in seven minutes. You did a great job, Sako. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's so, I mean, I was thinking, it's like, he hasn't had a sip of water or anything. And yeah. Yeah. that's hard to talk for like, over an hour, great, but that great job. Um, and we've had we've been holding steady with um over two hundred and thirty participants on this. So I think everyone's really interested in this subject matter. We have about ten questions in the Q and A that we're going to try to address in the remaining time. We're going to end right on time, you guys, at one o'clock. So anything that we don't get to, um, Sako, maybe you and I can hop on a video later and kind of plow through some of the remaining questions. We also had a ton come in on the registration forms as well. So um, like I said, there's a lot of um, interest in this subject matter and we wanna make sure to answer those questions. Sure. Yeah. With that, I'm gonna ask the question and then you answer and you can rapid fire or you can do it however you want. But um, our first question comes from Francis and she said, you referenced process addiction. Could you please define that? Yeah. Process addictions are also what used to be called behavioral addictions. Um, and they call it process addiction because it's not just one behavior thing I'm doing. It's a broader process. That's why it's called it. It's like, it's about the, the ritual. It's about the stuff peripherally around it. And so um, that's why they're called process addictions uh, versus just behavioral addictions. Hope that makes sense. Yeah. Great. Right. Connie asks, it seems to me that addictive behaviors start in those who have been abused and rejected. Their addictions seem to be feeling a need to be loved and accepted. Do you see this also? Yeah, I mean, that's what we do at BAI. We are, uh, we're not a 
trauma informed program. We're a trauma focused program. That's like the work we're doing right from the jump. Uh, now the kind of the benefit luxury we have in working primarily with folks identifying as having these process addictions is there isn't that um, as much of the like the detox and withdrawal that occurs with substance addictions. So there's more clarity from the beginning. And so it allows for greater stability around doing like trauma work early on, which I wouldn't necessarily do in substance treatment. I will, it depends, right? I've integrated in a certain way, but with substance treatment, there's this risk, right? Of like, is it going to result in relapse? Are they in this contained setting doing this great work? And then they leave and, you know, relapse on heroin and that could be fatal to them, right? So there's like considerations, which we get to do in more of the intimacy disorder space uh, that we don't get to do. But yes, absolutely, it's based in trauma. Now, there's also this phenomenon with screen addictions, video game addictions, and pornography addiction, where there's also this modern addiction framework, where early exposure and frequent exposure and it being woven into the part of like, in their lives, it's not necessarily paired with those same wounds and trauma from earlier. But the truth is like, who doesn't have some level of trauma, right? But um, you may see it more as the behavioral compulsivity. But the thing is with the behavioral compulsivity piece, that's easier to address. But if what you're seeing is you're addressing those and it's not really moving, then again, even with those individuals who seem like, okay, you don't have much of a trauma history, then become curious that there's probably more there. So I hope mm -hmm. that makes sense. Yeah. And I would imagine, because this came in, I don't think it's on this Q&A, but it was in some of the questions submitted yeah. uh, on the registration forms. Is a lot of people had questions about how do you address the shame part of specifically porn and sex addiction and intimacy disorders? And to me, what you just said about the trauma piece really tackle, because it's an underlying root cause, you know, it, it tackles that shame piece as well. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a whole bunch of, that's a great question. And it's like a very significant thing within the pornography addiction and sex addiction space. Um, a, a couple of different solutions to that. The main thing that actually, uh, you know, shame's message, uh, it's, it's evolutionary message as an emotion is, if people knew this about me, I would be unworthy of connection or they would cast me out that would disconnect from me. Well, if people disconnect from me in most of human history, if I was cast out of a group or disconnected from, my ability to survive would plummet because I would no longer be within a community. So it's not extreme to say that share that shame carries the fear of death within it um, in its internal impulse. And the main thing of its message is shut up, don't talk about this, hide it, is vulnerability is the antidote to it. Right. But vulnerability with people who have earned the right to hear my story and who I have some level of safety, I got to slow roll it. That's why them getting into a community where they're talking about this piece, they're reducing their sense of isolation within it. Other people are normalizing it. Right. And the mutual support groups such as SAA, SLAA, and SA have this tradition, which doesn't look like other 12 step meetings of your, in your first step is actually an autobiography of your story and addiction that you share with a group. You prepare it over a couple of months with the help of a sponsor. And that piece is designed to address the shame really early on because I'm sharing it with others and other people are nodding and going, mm -hmm, and then no one's shocked and no one leaves and people go, oh, yeah, me too. And then mm -hmm. you see the level of shame really go down around mm -hmm. that because seeing that I am worthy and people are not running from me is like a big part of addressing shame. So it's a great question. Yeah, that's great. Um, Christy asks, does it seem that the earlier people are introduced to technology, the greater the challenge with addiction? So basically, do millennials and Gen Z struggle with addiction more than, say, Gen X and boomers? To be honest with you, I don't know that data of like, is it just because early exposure to technology is everybody, you know, pretty much now, like almost everybody. Um so I don't think that that early introduction in and of itself is the only factor. Um, I bet you it's, I'm at, it, so what, what I know, it's early introduction, but paired with a lack of supervision, boundaries around it, um, an awareness of how I'm relating to it. And that was something that like millennials, for example, were the first generation that encountered because the boomers are typically the parents of millennials. 
And boomers didn't grow up with that stuff ubiquitously present. So they were the first generation in parenting to have to tackle like, my kid's playing a lot of video games, right? But there isn't like this like playbook when you talk to other parents on how to address video game usage. It's like, it's not a thing. <laughs> it was not a thing before. So it was this lack of like cultural family uh, school education system awareness around like, hey, this is a tool, but the way in which you're engaging with it really matters, right? And so um, it's like someone not having any education on the way they relate to food as a child, right? Like that's also a thing that would affect their relationship to it. So I think it's early exposure paired with a lack of support, boundaries, access, addressing the confusion, shame around it, around some of it, the curiosities, which I think honestly, like newer generations of parents are doing a good job of incorporating. Like Gen X has done a decent job, millennials even more so because it's like a part of their upbringing. So yes, that's, I would say that's kind of more of what I suspect it to be. Yeah. 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 Oh, let me say one more thing. Oh, sorry, one more quick thing. So when it comes to trauma, Note that if, if a child who's like seven has access to high-speed internet and goes and like encounters like hardcore pornography, they click on something accidentally and they're literally seeing this video or these images, their brain is not ready for those images and that intensity. And uh, the that is like a form of brain trauma for that child. So that kid, you know, and of course it's going to create this like fusion of like fascination and adrenaline and and so that right there can actually be a form of early exposure trauma to the brain if they end up somewhere that's going to be harmful to them, which comes back to that piece on supervision and like uh, boundaries around it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm going to jump down to Amy's because I saw this a lot too. Um, yeah. But uh, any specific resources you recommend to parents and other family members? I, I think a lot of people here are clinicians but a yeah. lot of them are parents. You're a parent. And um, maybe you could also address Claire's question about like, what is the minimum age children should be allowed phones and video games? And yeah. Internet? yeah. Um, as far as resources go, there, there, there are a couple of them that I'm not remembering off the top of my head that I can um, look up after this and suggest to, to Tara that do some like work around this. Um, but even looking into like within their uh, school system and maybe that in, in one's community or church, there's like a stuff around that piece where people are talking about it. Um, there's honestly some great education that's available on like, even like looking up things like YouTube and Googling some of this stuff. Like there's some resources available in this area around like healthy relationship screens and um, uh yeah, and, and part of it, I think, comes down to, like, the answer to most things with parenting, and I've come to discover this as a parent, is, like, it depends on the kid, right? Mm -hmm. Each kid has, like, these deferring needs and the way in which they engage with these things, um, and, um, and and tailoring that to what that what's going to be effective for that kid, because having, like, having it be over-boundaried backfires, right? Because then there's, like, this rebellion against it, and you know, I don't have a phone, all my friends do, and I can't even go on here. And they're like, they'll find a way to get to it anyway. Right. So it's about like managing that middle space of it, which is very hard to do. It's this like grueling journey called parenting, I think. So <laughs> and rewarding. Right. So yeah. Well, I think that's going to be the last one we have time for today. For what it's worth, Sylvia says, uh, oh, wait, no, it was Julia who said, I would love a part two. This is great. So maybe, maybe like I said, you and I can jump on a Zoom video and answer more of these questions, which could maybe be like a part two. Um, yeah. But with that, you guys, we're going to wrap up here. Um, lots of questions on, was this recorded? Yes, it was. You can access this recording on our YouTube channel. We'll also post it on Begin Again Institute's website. I'll just remind you that we have an intensive starting now. Not it's we don't treat adolescents at Begin Again Institute. Um, our minimum age requirement is 25 years of age, but we have an intensive starting this Saturday, and we do have two spots still left in that intensive. So, if you have a client who needs immediate trauma focused treatment and has 14 days uh, that they want to spend on really diving deep um, into a cohort model. Uh, 
Sako is going to be with, with our next group. He treats or works with all of our guys that come through Begin Again Institute. So uh, reach out to us. You can reach out to admissions at beginagaininstitute.com if you have a client in mind. With that, we're going to wrap it up. Um, thank you, Sako. You did a great job. Welcome. Thank you for being here and for expressing interest in this, all of you. And I hope uh, you were able to take something helpful away from it. Perfect. All right.